Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you very much. So, uh, to begin with, let me just uh, make a general observation about computational hardness and what happens when we discover that a problem is computationally difficult, which, uh, by which we usually mean NP-complete, but I'm going to show you a rather more, uh, ra rather, rather more obscure version of computational difficulty in just a moment. So uh, if you want to uh, come up with some algorithms that have performance guarantees, you uh, will typically do one of two things. And one of them you can do is you can say, right, I will I'll move the goalpost instead of looking for an optimal solution, say I might look for an approximately optimal solution, that kind of thing. And the other um, way people go is to look at a subclasses of problem instances which are considered to be realistic. Um, and it is in fact the second of these two paths that I'm going to follow in this talk. So. The very brief overview of the talk is as follows, that I'm sort of splitting it up into two parts, really. And the first half of this talk is, um, is, is a result that dates back to about 2006, the, uh, which is a sort of, this is a genuinely you know, important result that has found favor with the game theory community, which says that seemingly it is difficult to compute Nash equilibria. And the second half of the talk, I'm going to shift um, to a uh, more recent work, which is a class of games that I've taken an interest in, which, um, as I say, I believe they're realistic models of real-world um, competitions. And I'm also, um, we, we, we have some sort of partial results that suggest that they are quite a, um, that, that algorithms, that, that, that there exist polynomial time algorithms that solve them, and in fact, maybe even some fairly simple decentralized types of algorithms. So this is the, uh, the roadmap of the talk. So uh, let's go then. What I will do, I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm going to start with the basic definitions, of course, um, just to make it clear what I'm talking about here. We're talking about games in the very, uh, very, very classical sense in which a game has got a set of players. Each set of players has got, maybe I should say, a finite set of allowed actions. Each player can choose one of a finite number of things to do. And um, assuming that every player in the game chooses one of his own options, then the game is going to uh, produce a payoff. Well, a set of payoffs, one for each player. And uh, notice, of course, that um, under this um, definition, the payoff that a player gets can depend not only on what he does, but on what the other guys do as well. Okay. So examples will follow in just a moment. Um, notice furthermore, though, before I uh, show you a couple of examples, um, that if um, instead of choosing just a single action as a player, suppose that a player makes a, a, a probability distribution over his actions, and um, he just you know, assigns probabilities to each one, and suppose all the, all the players do so, then the game should therefore tell you a set of expected values that the players will receive from those uh, distributions. And uh, in that case, each player is going to be assumed to maximize his expected value. That's what players like to do. So um, finally, then, um, I can introduce, um, define to you the problem, which we um, follow the convention of sort of capitalizing these problem definitions. The computational problem, Nash, says, given a game, compute um, a Nash equilibrium of this game. So that is to say, a set of randomized strategies where the players can randomize over their strategies, and no player has an incentive to deviate, which means that if you take a look at any player, he's got an expected payoff based on these um, choices the players have made, and there exists no alternative strategy that he can choose, no alternative distribution over them, which will give him a higher payoff. Okay. So that is the very, very classical um, setting of game theory. And uh, this is the problem that we, uh, we take a look at. Is a strategy a function from the entire history of the game to the next move? Um, a strategy is quite simply a, uh, one of a finite number of options that the player can select. Uh, sorry, yeah, I mean... So the player knows the entire past history. So 
So it's a function from history to choice. Is that right? I'm really thinking about one-shot games here rather than, a, uh, you know, repeated games. Oh. Okay. Ah. So, so to make one move. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, yes, feel free to. Anyone <laughs> has questions, you should uh, interrupt. So let me show you a couple of examples now. And uh, the first one, this is one of my uh, favourite examples then, which is the Stag Hunt game, which uh, really dates back to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, discusses uh, the situation in his uh, discourse on inequality, and it's in the context of uh, the evolution of cooperative behaviour. He supposes that you've got two hunters, and each hunter can choose whether to hunt a stag or a hare. Okay. Now, the uh, trade-off that the players have is that... Um, in order to catch a stag, you require two of these hunters to cooperate together to catch a stag. A single player on his own cannot catch a stag. Okay? And furthermore, by contrast, a single player on his own can indeed catch a hare. So uh, that's the uh, sort of dilemma that these players face. And um, I should also point out, of course, that the uh, st stags are much bigger than hares, so uh, players would prefer to catch a stag. And let, let us make this a bit precise by um, writing up some payoffs. So in this, this is a payoff matrix, then, in which um, we have one player, the row player, who chooses one of the rows. The column player chooses one of the columns. And um, if they both choose to hunt a stag, they both receive payoffs of eight. If a player, cut, if a player chooses to hunt a hare, then, say, the row player, look at his payoffs, he gets one in either case, okay? He, he guarantees his hair, but he does not get any, he only gets one point. If, um, however, if I try to hunt a stag, say, as the row player, the other guy tries to hunt a hair, he goes off and just collects his one point of utility. The row player gets zero, because he's trying to hunt a stag without any assistance. So this is the uh, payoff matrix, and these little numbers in red they refer to the probabilities of a particular solution to this game, in which I'm giving both players a probability of one to hunt the stag, and um, therefore they, um, they do not have an incentive to deviate. If I can see the other guy hunting the stag, I do not want to go off and hunt a hare because my payoff goes down. Okay? Now, there's an alternative solution in which I just flip the ones and the zeros in these uh, labels, and if... Um, if I see the other guy hunting a hare, then of course I will just um, decide to hunt a hare myself. I will not do anything else. And uh, so this, this is another Nash equilibrium, an alternative solution. And finally, there's a third Nash equilibrium, which is the, the connoisseur's choice, if you like, amongst game theorists, in which um, if I hunt a stag with probability 1 8 and a hare with probability 7 8 then I've chosen these probabilities so that the other player becomes indifferent between the two options. He's, he is now, you know, his expected payoff would be the same. And that being the case, he might as well assign arbitrary probabilities to those two strategies. And in particular, I've chosen the same numbers for uh, the column player. And you have a Nash equilibrium in which both players randomize. So, you know, clearly this looks like a less plausible solution. Um, somehow, but you know, we would like some. This 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 suggests a number of things. That um, the fact that there are multiple equilibria suggests that it would be a good idea to look for mathematical um, criteria that um, tell you that one one equilibrium is more plausible than another one. And I would say that it also look, um, suggests you know this kind of thing. It also suggests another another sort of research topic of interest to me, which is. How would one actually arrive at an equilibrium? Um, you know, it's a, a way, a sort of informally then, a way to justify, you know, rejecting this particular solution is to say that it's, it's implausible that some natural process would actually end up with these two players um, gravitating towards um, these particular probabilities, and they would, you know, presumably be much more likely to... Um, you know, focus on one or other of these two pure strategy equilibria. Right, that's example one. Yeah. I'm not confused about this uh, incentive to deviate thing. You said there's only one move in the game. Uh, yeah. You said something about, well, if I see the other guy hunting stag, then I'm going to continue to hunt. So that implies that you repeat this game somehow. There's a kind of iterated thing. So there's a multi-move, really. 
Okay, in, in a sense, yes. Uh, for the moment, I mean, maybe I, I, I was digressing a little bit when I started discussing, uh, discussing um, you know, sequences of moves like that. Um, but, you know, technically, let's just, um, let me just stick with this very basic, very basic one-shot version in which a player, each player will announce a strategy, right? Uh, you, I mean, th this may sound a bit unrealistic, but a player will just announce that he's using some particular probabilities. Okay. Oh, and the other one does. Sorry? One announces, then the other one... Uh, both of them. L let's say that both of them just announce at the same time. They, th they, they, look at what, they look at what each one of them is saying, and um, they will, um, you know, mm. they, they will uh, be satisfied if what they're doing is optimal in the context of the other player's announcements. This is just, just the very basic, we're talk, we, uh, the very basic uh, framework here that we're using, in which um, players are just, um, they're, they're just trying to choose these probabilities and say, I will use these probabilities um, when we actually come to, you know, to actually play the game properly and decide which of those to, to choose. Okay? And the point I'm making is that if, if, the other player use, if the other player just says, I will use these probabilities, then putting myself in the, in the position of the road player, I will be quite happy to say, I will use these probabilities. Okay? So uh, that, that is the, uh, you know, the game we're playing, if you like. So uh, let me just show you another example, which I will refer to again later. So um, I'm calling this game the Dragon's Den game because it, you know, rep uh, refers to this uh, well-known TV show in which um, entrepreneurs compete for venture capital. And um, basically then, you have two entrepreneurs who are competing for an um, investment by a venture capitalist. And let us make the following assumptions about what the game, how the game works. If we call the entrepreneurs um, Alice and Bob, then um, let's assume that, okay, two things. Um, I'm mentioning that the two players can each do one of two things. They can decide to just present their business plan as they put it together. And the other thing a player can do is that he can spend, I've said, £5,000 on um, image consulting, by which I mean they're just going to get some advice from some, some expert on how to, uh, how to make their case most effectively. Okay? Now, um, I'm saying also, Alice, has, in fact, has got an in intrinsically better business plan and so if they both do the same thing, Alice will win the investment. And the only way Bob can win is if, um, if Bob pays this £5,000 and Alice fails to do so. Okay? So that's the game. The question, of course, is which of them will uh, buy the image consulting. And perhaps you've uh, had time to think a little bit about this question. And uh, you'll realize that if um, there exists no pure strategy solution, if if neither of them decide to spend the £5,000, then Bob will have an incentive to deviate. He will decide to spend it. Then, of course, Alice will want to spend it likewise. But then Bob will give up trying and he will go back to just presenting his case and losing without any uh, wasting money and so on. OK, so um, here's the payoff matrix that we, uh, we can write down. I'm just uh, I'm changing things slightly. I'm going to just pretend that a player will get £50,000 of utility if they win the investment. And if you just make that assumption, then we can write down payoffs that look like this, where, for example, if um, Alice spends 5000 and Bob also spends 5000 Alice gets 45 for winning the competition, minus 5000 for spending money. Bob gets minus 5 because he spent 5000 and still lost. OK. So is that reasonably clear, then, that uh, payoff matrix? Right. Now, uh, now I'm going to solve this game, but just to uh, um, do it in a slightly different way from the uh, just writing down some equations, let us draw a square which represents the set of probabilities that the players can use. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, both players are using low probabilities to spend, and up in the right, top right-hand corner, they're both using high probabilities to spend. Then I will sample this square at a bunch of places, something like this. And uh, the next thing I will do is I will look at the um, incentives to deviate. And I can draw little arrows that indicate which player has got an incentive to deviate. Roughly speaking, if we're down in the bottom left-hand corner here, where neither player is spending, 
then you can see that Bob is the one who will want to shift from not spending to spending, because that way he can win the investment. So we have these arrows pointing to the right. As we get you know, over here, then Alice starts to want to spend as well. And so we sort of come up like that. And um, when you take a look at this picture, then it's, I think, fairly obvious where you should go looking for the Nash equilibrium. It sits right in the um, sort of eye of the storm just here. And uh, that roughly, that's where you have a point where neither player can, um, um, will have any incentive to change their probabilities that they're using at this place here. So that Alice has got a relatively high probability to spend and Bob has got a relatively low probability to spend. The arrows have different angles. It's not just uh, right, up, or uh, both. Uh, that's right. Roughly, yes, if an arrow is, you know, as, as, you, know, as you sort of continuously move over here, uh, Bob's incentive to, yeah, sorry, Alice's incentive to deviate starts to increase more and more. So uh, that's roughly what the, uh, what the direction is meant to be showing you. So um, why did I do this particular kind of diagram in order to uh, solve the game? The answer is that I'm just uh, giving you a sort of intuition about how Nash's theorem works. And um, as it turns out, it appeals to uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, in which um, he shows that every continuous function on a compact domain has a fixed point. And uh, a fixed point is where you will um, go looking for a Nash equilibrium. So uh, roughly speaking, the uh, the way to prove Nash's theorem using Brouwer's theorem is to uh, convert a game into a continuous function from probabilities, the, the player's probabilities, um, to that same set, and um, construct it in such a way that you have, um, you know, you, you have a Brouwer function. And then, provided that players may randomize, you do need this um, to allow this to happen, there will indeed be a point where there is, um, you know, the arrows do not drag you in any direction. So, because we have a, uh, a guarantee that equilibria exist, we, um, this has become the sort of standard notion of the outcome of the game, because, you know, the game always does have this kind of an outcome. Um, as I said, it means that each player is receiving optimal expected payoff in the context of the other player's behavior. And um, the interesting computational challenge we face is how do we go about computing these probabilities? OK, we want an efficient algorithm. And um, what I'm going to do next, then, is to give you a sort of idea of the way. Um, so my, my claim, then, is that really there is evidence that Nash equilibria are hard to compute. And I'm going to explain to you how the search for these probabilities relates to certain search problem on, problems on large graphs, which are actually uh, hard to solve well, believed to be hard to solve for the same sort of reasons that NP-hard problems are believed to be hard. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, a quick overview before I do that. Um, right, what I've got is um, a quick reminder about NP-completeness, then an NP-complete problem is one that encodes circuit set. Now, um, you might well ask, why can I not just use NP-completeness as my criterion for computational hardness? Um, the answer is that it's precisely due to Nash's theorem, in fact. In a um, the search for a Nash equilibrium, so, okay, in a um, standard NP-complete problem, there are, you know, yes instances and no instances. And the yes instances are easy to verify. If you can see a proof, you can verify that it's, um, it's a solution. Um, in the case of looking for a Nash equilibrium, every instance is a yes instance. And that really sends you up against a brick wall if you actually try to make an NP-completeness proof, because there really need to be no instances. So uh, this brings us to a problem that Papa Dimitriou proposed back in 91, in which um, let's start by just thinking about graphs of degree 2. And in fact, um, let's look at graphs of um, in degree and out degree at most 1. So it's a directed graph, which um, has got in degree and out degree at most one. So actually, if I can just use this board, it's quite nice to just uh, draw a little picture. Roughly speaking, we have a graph. Maybe this blue is a bit easier to see. It's a bunch of lines. Yes, it's a bunch of lines. It's a bunch of paths and cycles. So uh, 
you can have a path that looks like this, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, you can also have cycles, OK? So uh, you can have this kind of thing going on in the graph. And that's about it. OK, topologically, the graph is kind of easy to understand. Now, um, having made that observation, we note that if we are actually shown a vertex of, of, um, of degree 1, OK, such as that vertex there, then we know that there must exist another vertex of degree 1 that's different from the one we were shown. And uh, therefore, the um, problem of searching for such a vertex is a total search problem. There's guaranteed to be a solution. Now, um, there is, of course, a catch, which is that in order to make this a non-trivial problem, we're not just representing the graph as a list of edges and vertices. We're going to represent it in a very compact way. We're going to represent the graph essentially using a pair of Boolean circuits. And um, the graph shall be exponentially large, so that we cannot just write it down. Let's, allow it, let's um, let its vertex set be bit strings of length n. And what these two Boolean circuits do is that they will take as input a bit string of length n. And one of them will output its, um, its upstream vertex, and the other one will output its downstream vertex. So these two, these two circuits, um, they allow you to do efficient local exploration on this graph. But if you're shown, if you're told, you know, for free that, say, the all zeros bit string is, um, has got um, out degree one, which is the standard formulation of this um, problem, then you um, cannot just expect to go and easily find another, ver another vertex of degree one because, um, because, you know, if you just try following the line, say, then you will be um, following an, exponential, an exponentially long path, potentially. Now, um, OK, so you've got this sort of hard graph search problem. Now, how on earth does that relate to uh, the search for equilibria of games? So I come back to this diagram then, which is going to give you give an idea of how that works. And suppose that I do the following. Suppose that I color code these, uh, these arrows according to this kind of scheme here, in which the, uh, if an arrow is pointing, say, uh, upwards or to the right, I'll color it blue, and if it's pointing down, I'll color it red, and I'll, otherwise I'll color it uh, green. In that case, I get this coloring here, and intuitively it seems like a good idea to go searching for a place where all three colors are close together. Okay, so uh, we're sort of moving from, uh, we're sort of translating this problem to one of searching for a bunch of co-located colors, which, you know, occurs precisely where we, uh, we find the Nash equilibrium, because that's where our points are being dragged in all, all different directions, you see. And so it, it, lo it looks like it should be a fixed point. Now, in two dimensions like this, it is sort of easy to find fixed points. Um, what you have to do to make this problem a bit more challenging is to, um, well, pretend that this diagram is, a, uh, is, you, is you know, high dimensional. And to make life a little bit uh, more complicated, I'm going to just point the arrows in sort of rather all sorts of different directions like this. Um, now, the, um, the reason why I've switched to a triangle rather than the square, well, for one thing, it's topologically <laughs> equivalent. And um, for another thing, it means that, as it turns out, this coloring scheme imposes certain useful boundary conditions on the triangle. And uh, if you think about it, what this particular coloring scheme is going to do is that it guarantees that this side of the triangle will be all red and blue, because any green arrow that was sitting right on the edge would be forced to jump out of the region, which we do not allow. Okay, so this is a red-blue edge. This is a blue-green edge, and in for the same reason, this is a red-green edge. Everything along this edge is red and green. So you've got these boundary conditions. The claim is that these boundary conditions are good enough to guarantee that somewhere, such as here, there will be a little triangle that has got all three colors. OK, a so-called panchromatic triangle, as we uh, refer to it, because it's got all the colors there. Now, um, if you believe this argument about the boundary conditions imposing, guaranteeing that such a triangle can exist, then um, this suggests the way that we can actually go about searching for a Nash equilibrium, which is that we would just repeatedly increase the resolution of this diagram 
retaining the um, retaining these boundary conditions as we do so, we find a panchromatic triangle here, for instance, and uh, if we just do so again, then once again we find a panchromatic triangle. It, it seems to be working, right? And um, if you believe this claim, then you know ultimately you can sort of zero in on a uh, genuine Nash equilibrium, which would just be the limit of some sequence of points that you generate in this way. So, so, uh, so at each step, so at each step you, you forget about, you pick your one panchromatic triangle, you forget everything else, you yeah. just zoom into that guy. Uh, yeah, so if you want me to... Really put all this other detail in. Um, you now, you're going to zoom into the one panchromatic one that you'd identify, is that right? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, what, what I could do then to... Uh, to actually, con the, here's the claim, to construct a Nash equilibrium, well, to construct a sort of fixed point of the underlying function that generated this picture, the way I could do it, let me just go back, is that I can, um, for sort of repeated d different granularities, I just, I find a panchromatic triangle first here, then say uh, here, and then say here. I keep going, you know, infinitely, and... Uh, there will be a limit point of this infinite sequence, and the claim is that a fixed point of the entire thing is, um, is, is that limit point, okay? And this, the, the, this really works. Now, the last thing that I have to do, though, is to convince you that really um, the boundary conditions are actually guaranteeing that these uh, panchromatic triangles are guaranteed to exist somewhere inside the interior. And this is where we make this connection with the search problems on large graphs. Okay. And the way to do this is that let's just go back to the low resolution version. And um, I'm going to draw a graph in which the vertices of this graph are the triangles, the little triangles themselves. And um, the edges of the graph are going to be constructed as follows. I will draw an edge between two adjacent triangles whenever it goes across a red-blue line like that, okay, with red on the left and blue on the right, so that orients the edge of this graph. And uh, I'll just fade out the colours so that you can see the graph a bit more clearly. You've got this large graph, therefore, lots of vertices and um, a bunch of edges in various places. And notice that because of this, this alternating red and blue uh, sequence here, there must be an odd number of entrances and exits going up the side of this diagram. And because there's an odd number of these entrances and exits, there must be a path that goes into this um, graph, say, particularly this one. It will go in, and instead of coming out somewhere else, it's just going to go in and stay, and it's going to end up somewhere. OK? And it can be shown without too much difficulty that you end up at a uh, panchromatic triangle. That's the only way one of these paths can come to an end once you've started it. So you talk about the other side. Blue. That's right. The other two sides of this picture do not contain any red-blue uh, edges. So all the entrances and exits of this picture lie along this side of the triangle. There's an odd number of them. And so you can get this kind of thing happening, but you can, you can actually um, convince yourself that there must be an entrance without an exit. Uh, yeah, there's a different colour at every corner, and you've got this, you, it goes blue, red, blue, red, okay, so yeah, there, there is an odd number of these points, okay, so, so it really works, and uh, what this does then is that essentially this is, this is how you get from the search for a Nash equilibrium to the search for a, uh, to um, these kind of end of the line searches of the kind that I drew here, but you know, as the resolution increases, the, uh, the size of this graph gets very big, okay? And indeed, if the game has got, you know, more than two, two players or more than two actions per player, then, you, then the, the size of this um, graph is increasing very rapidly as the resolution increases. So that's the general connection between these two seemingly um, disconnected problems. Now, um, just to... Uh, give you a very, uh, very sketchy overview of how we connect their computational complexities then. I've sort of done it in one direction, going from games to graphs. Um, so the uh, Papadimitriou's claim is that these, the, the, these graph search problems seem to be genuinely difficult. Um, 
they can sort of encode the difficulty of, of representing the search for a fixed point of very generic looking Brouwer functions which are just described using arithmetic circuits um, that um, map you know, points in the domain to other points in the domain. And um, what we did then in the context of games was to show that in fact you can, you can design games which um, actually do this kind of computation. You can actually um, simulate arithmetic circuits that you know, use uh, standard arithmetic operations like, like plus and multiplication. You can simulate them in the form of games so that ultimately an end of line graph search problem can be um, encoded as the search for a Nash equilibrium of a game. And uh, for that reason, the uh, search for an equilibrium of a game is actually at least as difficult as the search for the other end, for, for um, the end of a line in one of these um, exponentially large graphs that I've been telling you about. So, of course, um, I leave out the technical details. Let me just mention a few, uh, a few results. Um, a, a sort of subsequent result that came out soon afterwards is the... Uh, so we, we did it for four and then for three players. Um, then Chen Deng and Teng did it for the sort of key, uh, key case of just two players and n actions per player. And uh, another interesting paper, which you'll notice actually came out beforehand, um, showed that in the context of two-player games, if the payoffs are all um, either zero or one, so you've just got zero, one valued payoffs for any uh, pair of actions chosen by the players, then they already showed that that particular restricted subclass of two-player games was every bit as difficult as generic two-player games with, you know, um, say, rational numbers as their payoffs. So uh, once we had the PPAD hardness results for uh, two-player games, then straight away they extend to uh, this uh, PPAD hardness result for uh, these binary value two-player games. And so there has been... There has been a bit of follow-up literature, for instance, on the looking at um, sparse two-player games and when, um, under what conditions those games are still um, hard and when they can be solved in polynomial time. Anyway, um, oh yes, a quick uh, picture which is intended to give you a sort of feel for why it is that um, this is kind of... Uh, very sort of sketchy piece of intuition. You might um, you might wonder how um, what what do these hard cases actually look like? And so, with a bit of difficulty, I can draw one of these triangular diagrams in such a way that it's pretty hard to find the uh, to find a tri a panchromatic triangle just by sort of eyeballing the diagram. And the diagram sort of simulates a kind of maze which you have to just solve by um, you know entering it here and then um, you know wiggling around. So. Uh, that's a very, very sketchy intuition of how to make a hard case of this problem. Um, enough of that, though. I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about these ranking games to which the, uh, the title of this talk refers. And uh, I quite like this um, class of games, which seems to be fairly new. So um, here is the... Uh, Okay, yeah think, about, yeah, think about the Dragon's Den game, which I'm mentioning up there. Remember that. And we asked the question, suppose that instead of just two players, there's a whole bunch of players. We could also generalize it in other directions. We could say, um, I gave the players um, two choices. I could give them multiple choices of action. They could sort of not try very hard, or they could try rel moderately hard, or they could try very hard to win. And... Um, maybe there should be more than one prize for winning. So um, what's going on here is that the players are competing for rank. And um, if you think about competition for rank, then it occurs all over the place. The um, advertisers compete for rank on search engines. Universities compete for rank. We are all too well uh, from the academic community. We are all too aware of this kind of competition. Um, Athletes compete for rank in um, athletic competitions, and so also do individual departments as well as universities. And uh, we can even have sort of silly competitions for rank, which uh, occur between uh, nations unintentionally, so that um, you know, in a you know, in a survey like this, there's something. I mean, it's kind of stupid, but at the same time, it's kind of fascinating, isn't it? You see, I think that. 
competition for rank you see, I think it's, it's fascinating because it produces winners and losers. I think this is one very basic feature about it. Um, so you can always, every time a new league table comes out, you can always, you know, something's happened, right? You've, uh, you've either won or you've lost, and um, there's no incremental type of things going on, really. Well, um, and, you know, perhaps this kind of competition matters, because after all, if you have... If you think of some imaginary person who's a sort of completely free spirit who can decide where he wants to live, then why not just, you know, choose the country at the top of the lead table and go there, right? All other things being equal. So uh, even if that winning country happens to be only incrementally higher than the second one down, you might as well choose the winner, right? So uh, some of these, th you know, these competitions can really matter. So uh, this is what we're thinking about then. And um, so I now um, will just, um, in the remaining time, tell you about a class of games that represent this kind of competition for rank. And uh, the previous paper that really best ties in with the, uh, one, that, um, the one that I wrote most recently uh, came out um, last year then. Ranking games is a class of uh, games in which each player has got um, you know, strategies in the usual way but the outcome of the game will be a ranking of those players. And um, as you might expect, every player has got a monotonically decreasing utility as his rank goes down in this outcome. Okay, that makes sense. It's a restricted class of games. Maybe it's solvable in polynomial time because we've imposed a restriction. Unfortunately, uh, we can find out without too much difficulty, as it turns out, that... Um, OK, in the two-player case, you can solve these games. Um, in the three-player version, you can actually, without too much difficulty, encode an unrestricted two-player zero-one game, um, those games that I mentioned in passing as being uh, apparently hard to solve. So uh, ranking games as defined in this paper are generally speaking you know, hard to solve for the same sort of reason that other games are hard to solve. So what we do in our paper is that we look at a subclass which um, associates strategies with competitiveness. And roughly speaking, this is the kind of picture that it might be helpful to have in mind when we um, construct this model. Each player is going to have a function which maps, um, which, which maps a kind of upfront cost that the players play into, um, into an outcome, a level of attainment. Okay. So, um, roughly speaking, each player can decide how hard he wants to try, which corresponds to a bit like in the Dragon's Den game. You can pay some variable sort of sum of money up front, which is going to be your sort of initial level of competitiveness, and that will translate to a numerical level of attainment. Players will get ranked on that level of attainment or performance, and then prizes will be awarded. Okay? So, that's the general setup. Um, there is a body of literature in the uh, sort of social science literature, which I'm sort of gradually becoming uh, familiar with, but I've not really uh, gotten very deep into it yet. Um, this kind of game has been looked at in the context of um, a study of wage structures of organizations, so that if you are, the, uh, the, say, the boss of a factory, you would like to incentivize your workers to produce lots of stuff, and, uh, well, how could you do that? One way you could do that is to pay a piece rate. You could just say, um, I will pay you some amount of money for each item that you produce. If you do that, then um, obviously it does incentivize each worker to produce more rather than less stuff. On the other hand, there's an obvious, well, there, 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 there's, there's a sort of obvious downside, which is that you do not know in advance how much you'll have to pay. Um, you do not know how hard the workers will... Um, um, how much stuff the workers will produce. And one way of getting around that problem is to say instead, right, I am going to uh, take a look at how much you've each produced at the end of the month. And the guy who's produced the largest quantity of stuff, I will pay you 10,000 pounds. And the guy who's produced the second largest quantity, I will pay 5,000 pounds, then maybe four and a half thousand and so on down. Um, so, uh, you award a sequence of prizes to the players based on their productivity, and you just let them get on with it. You let them compete. Yep. I mean, the context of complete information, like 
values of being at the human rank for a player? Is it common knowledge? Or um, at the moment, I'm going to assume it is common knowledge that the players do actually. Uh, sorry, yeah, the players actually see this diagram. So, uh, roughly speaking, I'm going to say that. Uh, yeah, each player can actually. He he knows how much he will produce as a function of the um, the amount of effort he invests. Okay, and he also knows knows a similar thing about the other players. So, just assume that for now. But you know, arguably, it's a. Uh, it's a big assumption. So uh, we do have this, have this game which is sort of entirely presented to us. And, uh, yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah. Do you think that it is kind of how the effort uh, maps your payment? And there is a second one which is for a given player, how much does he value being the length for the particular? Okay, so that is... assume both of these to be common knowledge. Uh, yes, I'll assume them to be common knowledge. Yeah, I mean, in, the in, the, in this um, question about how much a player values being first rather than being second, say, um, I guess in the, uh, in the version we thought about in, in the paper, we just assume that the prizes are the same for each player, that each player has the same valuation for winning the first prize and the same for the second prize, but, but that is a sensible generalization. So... Um, one thing that we do that kind of gets away from this previous literature, seemingly, is that we actually discretize this, um, this x-axis because we, um, we, we want to look at finite games, okay, because they're, they're, they're guaranteed to have Nash equilibria. And this earlier literature seems, you know, maybe rather, rather more realistically in some, in some sense um, to have continuum, a sort of continuum of upfront effort, which... Uh, is in a sense more realistic, in another sense it means that you do not guarantee a Nash equilibrium to exist. So let's just um, get around that by discretizing this, this x-axis. So, uh, right, I've just got a bit of time to give you a quick overview of the results. Um, okay, yes, right. Um, as I've kind of hinted then, I, hopefully it will not be necessary to... Uh, memorize this notation too much we give each player let's say a set of n actions a one so player i then will get actions ai1 through ain like that and um, each action aij has got a cost cij which is the, this upfront payment and a return as we call it rij um, players get ranked on the rij values that they actually you know select and um We'll award prizes based on those um, rank positions. We can say the case prize has got value UK, U for utility. Um, and so finally then, the, the overall utility of a player is the cost of his action, sorry, the, the, the negative cost of his action, plus the utility of the prize that he actually wins. Okay, so that is the, uh, the payoff that a player gets. So, um, and a sort of fairly, oh yeah, this is a kind of pre-processing step, I guess, which is that it's, um, if you think about it, um, we can actually arrange these, the actions of a player in order of both increasing cost and increasing return. And uh, both of these two uh, quantities will increase, you know, with each other, because if, let me just, I mean, I can do this by going back here. If these functions were actually not monotonic, they need to have dominated strategies, and we just, you know, let, 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 let's eliminate those dominated strategies. So uh, there's a kind of pre-processing step that just eliminates dominated strategies and assumes that the AIJs are arranged in increasing order of how competitive they are. And um, a sort of nice observation, I think, is that these games can be concisely represented, even if there are many players and many... Um, strategies and that puts them in contrast with unrestricted ranking games of the sort that occurred in this previous paper where um, because the outcome because there was no particular correlation between uh, between strategies and the outcome then you essentially roughly speaking you have to sort of insert into each box of the payoff table you have to insert a particular ranking of the players which is not you know governed by any anything else and so um, they do not have this um, automatic, concise representation of games with many players. So there is that nice feature about these ones. Um, 
I will just, um, well, I think in the time that remains, I'll just tell you the main results that we've got, which basically say, okay, there's a bit of stuff that you can sort of pre-processing that can be done. Um, so let's see, the first prize then, sorry, the first result is saying that if there's a single prize, just one, one prize for winning and nobody else gets anything if they lose, um, you also have to assume that ties are impossible, so, so things are getting a bit special casey, uh, but that's where we're at so far. Then um, there's, there's, there's the, the Nash equilibrium, there is just one. Um, has the single player getting positive expected payoff and uh, in particular the player who gets the positive expected payoff is the one who's got the strongest action the one who actually can guarantee a win so he's going to get positive payoff the others all get zero now essentially the payoffs of this game then in the Nash equilibrium they are as if this one winning player played his strongest action with probability one and all the other guys promptly caved in and played their weakest action with probability one in fact, the Nash equilibrium is, 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 fully, is typically mixed, and it's not pure, and it just happens to give the same payoffs as if this was really going on. Okay, so that's um, result number one, which works for certain you know, special cases, and it's kind of interesting. That's the proof which I will skip. Um, another result states that if, um, once again, the single prize case, um, Suppose that, okay, once again, if you've got one prize and, there, and um, players cannot tie to win a prize, then um, the uh, theorem says that if you know the support of the solution, that just means um, in a Nash equilibrium you know which strategies get non-zero probability, then you can figure out what those probabilities really are. You can actually compute the probabilities, and they happen to be in rational numbers. Um, this looks um, at first sight, I don't know if it's, you know, you might wonder why we should care. The uh, interesting thing about this fact, to me at least, is that um, these games have got, you know, this is something they've got in common specifically with two-player normal form games, which they do not have in common with games of more than two players. In general, two-player games have got rational solutions, meaning rational numbers. Um, you cannot have... Um, on, on the, sorry, on the, uh, and in contrast then, a game of three players, even if the payoffs in the, uh, in the game are all rational numbers, then in the Nash equilibrium, the uh, probabilities that arise can in fact be irrational numbers. They have to be algebraic, but they need not be rational. So you've got something in common between these, these games that we consider and just um, two-player normal form games. I don't know whether, whether I should be interested in that, but I pointed out. And... Um, so, uh, yeah, finally then, um, we've got a couple of polynomial time algorithms. And uh, at this stage, we shift from computing exact Nash equilibrium to computing approximate equilibria. Um, oh, yeah, for, for two-player games, we can do it exactly. They're typically fully mixed. They've typically got fully mixed solutions. If there are more than two players... Um, we, s we have to switch to approximate equilibria. As I say, I don't know how to solve these games exactly, but I suspect they ought to be solvable exactly. Um, the result states, okay, in approximate equilibria, basically it means when you replace this um, no incentive to deviate criterion with just a low or limited incentive to deviate. That's what's meant by an approximate equilibria. And if we we fix an approximation guarantee, then we can find a, you know, approximate equilibria via a kind of brute force algorithm. And uh, with a bit more effort, there is in fact a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, which is to say when the, the dependence on the, uh, the quality of the approximation is not too bad, that's really what's going on there. Um, in the case where we've got um, some limited number of players and a single prize. So, uh, we do have this result, um, and I guess, you know, what I would like to know is whether we should be able to find exact algorithms rather than, than these approximate ones. So, um, I'm going to skip this topic and just uh, conclude. So, um, yeah, to sort of summarise then, um, I've given you a sort of brief overview of why it is that unrestricted games are hard to solve and um, 
The catch, though, is that games, completely unrestricted games, to be hard to solve, you really have to have, uh, have to generate them using a sort of notional adversary, which means that the games themselves are not really very realistic somehow. Um, we might well hope that sort of natural games do not have this problem. And uh, so I've mentioned, you know, I've mentioned a couple of algorithms and a couple of open problems for these games. One thing that I'm interested in would be looking for natural decentralized algorithms that work for these games. And uh, I, I, I might mention in passing that we've done a bit of experimental work that suggests that fictitious play really does work for these games. That is to say, one, one specific sort of simple decentralized algorithm happens to uh, appear to do, uh, to do a good job. And um, another way that I've, you know, the, the direction that we've actually gone so far in the paper was to uh, essentially shift the goalposts and replace exact with approximate equilibria, whereupon we did find a few, a few algorithms that really did the job of finding approximate equilibria. So uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, oh, hang on. Oh, if you've got continuous action spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah. There typically is not necessarily a Nash equilibrium if you've got continuous action spaces. I mean, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. Um, and I don't know the details of where, <laughs> where it breaks down, but um, yes. Um, for now, I'm I am just discretizing everything. Uh, mostly it is, yes. So, I mean, if you generalize the one to two, you get a similar result, where essentially for two of the ties, it's as if you have the two of the highest action who uh, essentially play their strongest. Um, so, it's like I feel like I ought to know that, you know. Yeah. It, the, we, we've certainly not proved, managed to prove something like that. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of thing that, you know, seems like it would be worthwhile to run a few experiments <laughs> at this stage to see whether um, that seems to be the case. Uh, but offhand, yeah, well, I mean, obviously we've thought a bit about the multiple prize case. Um, and it seems that extra prizes do make the, uh, do make the problem a bit harder for some, you know, somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we do not have many results for the uh, for the multiple prize case at the moment. So maybe a quick question. So, yeah. uh, so the, the context was like computational complexity of natural equilibrium, mm -hmm. people with a single prize. So what other questions people have looked at? I don't know. I know that you know like people have looked at like incomplete information gains when the goal is to maximize the total effort or collective effort. Uh, if you could comment like you know what other other kind of questions Okay. Games. Oh, in ranking games, um, nothing that I know of from the point of view of computational complexity so far. So there have been, as, as I mentioned, you know, there are various other types of game, um, so anonymous games then, in which you have. Um, so this is work by uh, uh, Papata, mainly by Papa Dimitriou and Daskalakis. Um, which look at games of where uh, they have many players and the, uh, the way an anonymous game works is that there's a limited number of strategies that the players can use and a player's payoff depends on which strategy he uses and how many other players use that strategy. Okay, so uh, they've, got some, they, they've got some positive results for anonymous games, although they're sort of in the most general version, they are still, uh, they are still PPAD complete, I believe. So that's, you know, that, that, that is one class of games that has been studied in this kind of context. All right.